The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Welcome to Public Health America, a weekly program produced by BronxNet in partnership with Mercy College. I'm your host, Dr. William Latimer. Here on Public Health America, we speak with experts from an array of specialties across the liberal arts and health professions to provide you with not only the best science, but practical tips to live a healthier life. We also celebrate what studies have long documented, namely the unparalleled value of a liberal arts college education by setting the stage to pursue a career of your choice, increase lifetime earnings, and engage in civil debate. Our experts will share decisions they made and support they received that helped them to beat the odds. By sharing one or two life lessons, their stories may provide you with the inspiration and method to realize your dreams. This is Public Health America. Welcome to Public Health America. I'm your host, Dr. William Latimer. It is such a pleasure to have Dr. Shalita Amler on our show today, the Commissioner of Health of Westchester. Shalita, welcome. Thank you. So uh, I have to open with this. I, I, I need you to, I want you to know, I've written two letters in the last week. One went to the Queen of England, and I'm suggesting that you be knighted for your service. <laughs> and the other went to the Pope, and I am suggesting you be sainted for your service. I don't I know, time. Outcome, but I will keep you posted. So, you know, who could have predicted the last two and a half years and all of the uh, ebb and flow of the variants and we're in good shape and then we're not in good shape and there are test kits and there are not test kits. What a utter and complete nightmare for everyone. Let me start with this. Uh, you're the health commissioner of Westchester. How is Westchester doing these days? Well, you know, as you may remember, we were one of the original epicenters of COVID back uh, when this all began in March of 2019. Uh, we had one of the very first cases where there was widespread community uh, spread of, of COVID. And so we've been in the midst of this, really in the heart of it, uh, since the very beginning. So I think as a whole, uh, our community is well educated around COVID and what they can do to protect themselves. Um, and, you know, we're just trying to um, take what we've learned over the last two years and try to continue to protect our citizens the best way we can with everything that we know from the past and all the things that have worked and continue to uh, be relevant to today. Do we know, I mean, in terms of Westchester, do we have a sense of like the rate of vaccination? Actually, we have a very high vaccination rate. Our, our vaccination rate in our 18 plus population with at least one dose is 96%. So um, right. we, you know, our, our residents have largely understood the importance of vaccine. I think uh, where we are today that's a little different maybe with Omicron is that we are seeing disease in people that are fully vaccinated. And right. um, so, you know, that's kind of throwing a big monkey wrench into um, where we thought we were going and what we thought we needed to do. So let's talk about Omicron. My understanding is that when you are vaccinated, that the symptoms will likely be greatly reduced if you have that vaccine status. And if you don't, that it, it that's when you're more likely to land in the hospital. Is that is that a fair statement? You're absolutely correct. When we look at uh, who's in the hospital who has severe disease, it is largely, predominantly unvaccinated individuals. So it's kind of like influenza, you know, I mean, I've been talking to the public about influenza for <laughs> more years than I care to count. And what we always told people is the vaccine may not keep you from getting the flu, but it will keep you from dying from the flu. And the same thing seems to be true 
for COVID. It may not totally prevent you from getting COVID, but chances are you're not going to have severe symptoms. You're not going to end up in the hospital and you're not going to die from COVID if you're vaccinated. Got it. So let's talk about vaccine safety. I know this might be an outdated uh, topic, but still relevant. Um, what is the, uh, are there safety issues with respect to getting vaccinated? My understanding is that obviously millions have been vaccinated and there are no significant safety issues, but I think it's important to still discuss that. You know, I know that people always have concerns with vaccine and that's nothing new. I mean, you know, we've been vaccinating people for uh, since uh, smallpox vaccine first came out. Uh, so for a very, very long time. And there have always been people who've had concerns. But this vaccine has had the most scrutiny of any vaccines that have ever been made. And as you said, there have been almost no um, uh, adverse event, uh, events um and I think that um, the one that seems to bother people the most or gets the most play is um, myocarditis. And it's important to remember that myocarditis is possible uh, for people who simply have COVID. And we do see myocarditis in young people who have had COVID. Um, but, um, you know, I think by far, when you look at the outcomes, it's clear to see that um, vaccines are so much safer than not being vaccinated. Your your chance of dying from COVID is substantially greater. And isn't that what really counts, that people don't die from this virus? So uh, one of the advantages of being surrounded by really smart colleagues uh, at Mercy College is that they send me questions like this one. Uh, and I'm reading this uh, from an email. It is not clear in the CDC guidance about close contact quarantine. If you are vaccinated but not boosted, you don't have your booster, and simply exposed to a case, like being in a classroom or in, in, in a uh, restaurant or something, not necessarily less than six feet or more than 15 minutes, do you need to quarantine for five days? And if that's too precise a question, forgive me. <laughs> no, I, I think this is the major difference. You know, uh, with the Previous variations of COVID, um, people who were fully vaccinated were golden and we didn't worry so much about them. We didn't even quarantine them. But now we know that with Omicron, which is much more infectious than the previous variations of this virus, that people who um, are fully vaccinated can, in fact, um, uh, go on to develop it. So it is important that although we don't quarantine individuals who have had their primary series and had their booster, um, unless they're symptomatic, they're not required to, to uh, quarantine. But I would say that if you've had an exposure, even if you are fully vaccinated and have a booster, that you want to be careful and watch for symptoms. And if you develop symptoms, you should isolate yourself and then get tested because there are no guarantees with this new uh, Omicron that you might not go on to get the disease, depending on the extent of your exposure. Sure, that makes a lot of sense. You know, it just seems with the latest variant that, you know, and by the way, I mean, obviously to state the obvious, the last two years have been horrible and we've lost a lot of people and that's, absolutely terrible. It, it, it seems though that the last couple months that it has just been a watershed of infection. And luckily because of the vaccine rate being high in the U.S., the uh, sequelae of that infection has been less than it would have been otherwise. But it just seems like it is becoming endemic, like from pandemic to endemic. Uh, do, are we at a point where th that we need to accept the fact that sooner or later, we're all going to get this? Or is, you know, like, you know, I have three young kids. I, I am hyper vigilant uh, with mask wearing and uh, getting the vaccine and, you know, distancing 
when able and uh, reducing uh, large family visits, which is very, you know, stressful, you know, so what lies ahead? Where are we at? So first of all, I mean, I get people saying Omnicom, it's just like a common cold. There's no need to worry. And for most people, that is true. But if you are unvaccinated, that may not be true. We see severe disease and we're still seeing people die from COVID with the Omicron variant. Although, as you said, people who are vaccinated tend to have milder disease. So there are still portions of our population that cannot be vaccinated. Children less than five, people with some underlying medical conditions cannot be vaccinated. So it's still really important that we protect the population that we cannot vaccinate. So if you have small children under five, it's really terribly important that you get vaccinated yourself so that you don't bring this home. And, you know, so that you still try to protect those people from large populations, as you were saying, you don't want to invite your whole family over. If you have young children who are under five, or if you have a family member that maybe has cancer, hasn't been able to be vaccinated uh, because they could still be at risk. But yes, I think that with Omicron, which has been exceedingly infectious, huge parts of our population uh, have been recently infected. And we'll have to see if this in some way provides herd immunity to a big part of our population uh, and where, what happens going forward with this. Sure. So we have about a minute left in this first half of the segment. Um, what do we think, um, what is our chance of, uh, when do we anticipate having the vaccine for children under five? Well, I mean, I know they're working on it and we're hopeful that it will be sometime this year, but I can't give you an exact date. Uh, I know that um, they certainly have been um, working very diligently to try to get to the under five. But as you can imagine, it is hard to recruit for uh, studies where human studies, when you're asking people to include their small children, and so it does make that more of a challenge to get the numbers uh, that you need to, you know, to say that it's safe for children under five. But I know that all the vaccine companies are certainly working on this. And the goal is hopefully within this year, we will have a vaccine for uh, our youngest population. Good news uh, on the horizon. So we're going to take a quick break. When we return, Dr. Sherlita Amler will tell us more about the excellent work that Westchester Health is doing, the Commissioner of Health and Westchester is doing uh, to keep the population safe, to keep people safe. This is Public Health America. I'm your host, Dr. William Latimer. We'll be right back.
We built a media network for you. Bronxnet TV. Come learn in your new state-of-the-art studios at Lehman College. At Mercy College. And coming soon to the South Bronx in the Hub. Inspire with your stories, culture, history. Your Bronx on Bronxnet. Engage with us. Connect with us at your channels and at Bronxnet.tv. Learn. Engage. Inspire. Bronxnet TV. From the Bronx to the world. <laughs> Bronxnet. <laughs>
but that there are a lot of folk that have uh, COVID, but don't test positive. Um, talk, talk about the tests. So as you said, the PCR is the gold standard and that's the best test that you can get. The problems with that test in that it can take two to three days to get your test results. A lot can happen in two to three days. You could have exposed your entire family in that time frame and everyone you know. So although it is the gold standard, we've kind of backed down because it just isn't available and it takes so much time to get the results. So we're encouraging people to get whatever test you have access to. And just remember, if it's positive and it's an antigen, then accept that it's positive. Don't keep testing to try to get a negative result. You know, so if your test is positive, presume that it is. Isolate yourself. Don't expose others, especially people who are not eligible for vaccine or people who might have a really bad outcome, such as your elderly family members. So this is not the time to go see your 90-year-old great-grandmother or it's not the time to visit family member who are seriously ill, or it's not time if you have young children to bring your entire family in for get together. So we just have to be smart in how we behave um, given the current circumstances and use the tests that are available. We're actually providing tests to school students, to schools and uh, a bunch of schools recently were given tests that their families could come pick up and use at home. And these are largely antigen tests. So we would say if you get a positive antigen, it's positive. And then you just have to address how you uh, how you deal with those results. So uh, for what it's worth, I utterly and completely agree with you uh, of what you just, everything you just said. And I mean that sincerely. I think what concerns me is Lots of people don't. <laughs> how how do meaning? I'll give you an example. I think after two years, people are so, and I'm going to use this word deliberately. They're they're desperate to see their family members. They're desperate to see their 90 year old grandmother. Uh, and and I don't mean this critically of what you said because I completely agree with you. I think we still are at a point where that sadly, isolation is a necessary evil. How do we, how do we weigh the pros and cons of that? How do we balance that? And how do we communicate to the population the risks they're taking? Well, you know, as you know, CDC just reduced the isolation uh, time from 10 days to five days. And so um, for the general population. And so I think that will um, help some people. But we have to remember who's at risk. And that's the most important thing. So uh, if you test positive and you're, you know, you want to see your other family members, I can understand that. But what you don't want to do is kill your family. OK, so that means that you have to be smart in who you expose yourself and your disease to. So, as I said, you know, if you have family members and you are honest with them, hey, listen, I just tested positive for COVID. Uh, you know, um, I have done my five day isolation, but I'd like to see you and I'm well now. I have no symptoms. Wear your mask have them wear their mask. You know, you can still social distance. Uh, you can meet outside. There are things that you can do that could still enable you to see your family members, but do so in a safe manner. And so this is not a time to go face to face, less than six feet from somebody if you've just tested positive, unless you want to give them COVID. And, and that's exactly what could happen. So the good advice is still you know, wear the mask, socially distance, you know, obviously if you test positive, quarantine and stay away, uh, have those family meetings outdoors. These are the core elements that will help uh, uh, stay further infection. And avoid unvaccinated members of your family or people who are at serious risk for disease. Got and it. I think those are the most important things. And you summarize that beautifully. Good. All right. I, I am now going to tell my wife that I am educable. 
She has sometimes <laughs> doubted that fact. Um, so let me ask you this. You know, you are a commissioner of a public health uh, entity of Westchester, a very large uh, region, catchment area with millions of citizens. Um, just let, let me ask you this. What's it been like? I mean, were, were public health commissions ready for this? Did they, were they resourced appropriately? And what it, this just feels like such a game changer in terms of how public health is understood and how it's approached. Talk a little bit about that. I think, uh, unfortunately, public health departments are a lot like the fire department. You know, most of the time what we do, people don't understand. We don't treat disease for the most part, other than like TB, sexually transmitted diseases, and provide vaccines. What we try to do and do very well is we prevent disease. But it's hard for people to understand the value of something that never happens. So it's kind of like, like I said, the fire department. If there's never ever fire you're not sure you really want that fire department or do you want to pay for that fire department? But if your house is on fire, you're very grateful that it's there. Right now, our country is on fire with a virus that, you know, um, is, is, is quite damaging. And so public health at the moment is appreciated and a lot of money has been pouring into public health. My concerns is what happens when this is over? Is it going to go back where uh, because we don't, actively treat disease, we prevent disease, people don't understand what we do and the funding will dry up. And unfortunately, if this happens, something like this happens again in the future, we won't be prepared. Um, it's taken us two years to really have the staffing that we've needed to do the work that we do. Um, and, um, you know, it's just, it, it's just a problem with when you, when you try to prevent things that prevention is not always understood or appreciated. Understood. So, it, 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 and for what it's worth, I mean, I will say or suggest prior to the pandemic, when I said, oh, I have my MPH in epidemiology, uh, half of the time, the answer I received was, oh, you're a dentist. Uh, I think there is a greater understanding of the nature of population health, of the nature of public health, and what that entity does. I cannot thank you enough, Dr. Sherlita Amler, for taking the time to talk to us about the pandemic, the amazing work that you're doing in Westchester, and the importance of understanding social distancing, mask wearing, getting the vaccine, getting the booster, and uh, understanding how each of our behavior uh, affects the population as a whole. Thank you so much. This is Public Health America. I'm your host, Dr. William Latimer. Take care. Mm -hmm.